and this person said, I resist the usual by deliberate acts of loving kindness. That's a lovely thing, lovely. Um, he goes by the name of Darren Robson, we haven't met yet. Come up. I know, I've done the same thing. If I start thing. to feel intimidated, I'll take the glasses off. <laughs> I like that plan. That's a good plan. Okay, so uh, just to give you a little bit of information on <coughs> Mr. Robson. So pretty much, this is what we have been told, pretty much the godfather of Natalka design. And overall smart, and he says, yes, the photo confirms it, because I've got a little photo of, of Darren playing, what is that? Air guitar. An air guitar. <laughs> And yeah. two, o'clock or more, <laughs> 2 o'clock in the morning at my wedding. Um, and a skilled guy who happens to run a number of successful businesses. Tasmanian Devil must have been based on his character. Okay, wow. Tasmanian Devil based on you. Tell us more. Uh, Natalia wrote that. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> I didn't write it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no. So I think, I think the, the principle there is that I kind of... Um, I don't hurt anyone. I don't eat anyone, but I spin around <laughs> doing lots of things. I've got lots of energy, even though I might come across quite calm on here. Uh, you know, I, I have a huge amount of energy, and uh, I suppose Tasmanian Devil was definitely more true five or six years ago. I suppose as you get a bit older, you start to learn to focus that energy, so there, mm -hmm. there's a calmness that comes in. So Tasmanian Devil definitely, but there's a sort of a calmness to it that's a bit different now. Well, you've definitely still got the energy. I, I, I'm feeling it already, and I think that all of these people who just touched you are buzzing right well, now. Well, you know, I mean, if you can see my aura. Can you see my aura? <laughs> the glow around you. Okay, so we've found out a little bit about you already, but um, you said that was based on, on Natalia's word. Okay, fine, so you've calmed a little bit. Um, but tell us deeper, who are you? Oh, God. Asa Jolie's work here, transpersonal psychology. Who am I? Um, I've still, I'm still figuring that out, actually. I don't, uh, you know, Hermione was talking about uh, Shakespeare's life is a stage, and transpersonal psychology teaches us um, that uh, we've got lots of different role identities. Um, and then it's the big question, the most profound question in life, is to imagine all those cast of characters on a stage, and then who is the eye that is observing all those cast of characters? Uh, and I think once you get to that, you get to your very authentic, uh, who you really truly are. Mm. Um, so I think that it's not about an identity, so it's not a role, it's not Darren the entrepreneur, Darren the dad, Darren the friend, Darren the lover, to bring it into dildos. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's not any of that, I think it's just about, uh, I suppose if you want to say it in a really, really esoteric way, mm. it's kind of love. Mm. So it's an energy, and, and like, I think we're all energy, mm. uh, and I think we, uh, the more that quantum physics starts to show us that, the more neuroscience and the sciences catch up with uh, the way we are, I think that you realise that we are energy, uh, and I completely agree with her, Hermione's way around, you know, life is very short, um, and, and those of you who know me, that sort of one of the things that's inspired me was was probably one of the darkest moments in my life, which mm -hmm. was 15 years ago, when, when my mum suddenly died of an epileptic fit. Um, and then last year, this time last year, my wife and I, uh, Mirka, uh, end of October last year, we were in a, a serious road accident in Budapest, uh, and I was knocked unconscious. I had eight stitches in my eye, fractured sternum. Um, so what happened to my mum 15 years ago, where I saw on the Sunday night and then the Monday she was dead. And then last year in October, I was in a, in a taxi going from We'd just been running a conference, our not-for-profit had been running a conference, and we, I picked up Mirka from the airport and we were travelling to go and have a great weekend in Budapest, and suddenly the next thing I wake up and, you know, I'm smashed up, Mirka's lost a tooth, her nose is smashed, and it was just like, so I think Hermione's point around life is short, mm. I've had an urgency in my life from very early, but 
those last 15 years and I think the Tasmanian Devil part of that was because I was scared I wasn't going to survive and my mm. friends always remind me of I used to say I'm not going to make it to 21 and then when I got to 21 it was I'm not going to make it to 30 and then it was like I'm not going to make it to 40 and I think hopefully now I've got to the grand old age of 72 um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm actually starting to feel that I might be around for a bit uh, I'm actually 42 I know you're surprised you think he's no no older than 30 uh, um, no, no, so I, th I think there was an urgency to me because I was, I was scared of the fact that mm. life was so transient. And also, uh, I grew up on a council estate and, and, and we were very close-knit and I lost three or four friends at the age of 16, 17 in motorbike accidents, car accidents wow. and stuff like that. And I think when you've, you've been around that and then, you know, what happens to your mum, you start to think, shit, you know, I've got, I've got, to, I've got to live it. So mm. a lot of what Hermione was saying was it resonates, but for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, so I think that's where the Tasmanian Devil energy sort of came in. Hopefully now, uh, you know, I'm a bit, I'm slowing down. Not slowing down because I'm more focused than I've ever been. So I'm using that energy in a way that's much more focused. Whereas before it was quite all yeah. over the place. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm getting increasingly clear mm -hmm. on the stuff that I can make a contribution to. So at 42 now, what would you tell your 16-year-old self? Um, fantastic question. Um, you're a tosser. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm joking. Uh, no, what would I say? I would say um, you don't need to. You don't need to push so hard because mm. actually, you know, you can. You'll get to where you want to get to. Mm. Uh, and also, actually, uh, the more things take a bit of time, the more you can appreciate them. Mm. So at 16, I was in a rush to always be successful or to do this, do that, <clears> do that. And you know, I've been fortunate that I've achieved a lot of the things that I wanted to achieve and there's a whole bunch more that I'd like to achieve. But if I don't achieve them anymore, I'm not so worried. You know, so one of the real insights from last, last year after Budapest mm -hmm. was that you know, of the three organisations that I've helped create and grow over the last 15 years, they all ran without me. Yeah. And, I, and I think that was one of the things that I was most proud of because you know, Kids Company is an organisation that I, I work with, we were partnered with them. Uh, I love Camilla. But to see what's happened to kids' company over the course of the last six mm. months, it's devastating to me because they're such an awesome organisation. Yeah. But I could predict it was going to happen because of the fact that there wasn't the infrastructure in place to support it for the long term. Right. And, I, and I think I've learned from great people like Camilla and others through the stuff they do really well and the stuff that maybe they don't do so well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and as I said, after the accident, I couldn't do much. I was pretty incapacitated. I had double vision for seven weeks. Mm. I didn't really do too much. And everything carried on without me. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's the thing. And I think also, sort of losing my mum, who was, I think those of you who've, who've unfortunately lost your mum, mm. I think it's different. Because I think they're the person that brings you into the world. And when they go, for me, it left a hole in me, absolute hole in, in my chest. And, and that, that hole's closed somewhat now. But, but I think that, you know, when you lose someone as important you as that, and, and then you see that life goes on, even though she's no longer here, mm. it kind of makes you realise how beautiful life is, but also tough out and tough life is. Yeah. Does that make sense? And, and also, seven billion people in the world, you're one life. Mm. You know. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I guess then, from some of the events that you've just described, uh, you have a real sense of of not taking things for granted. So what really? What's one of the most simplest things that makes you happy? Travel. So I've just got back from, so in the last six weeks, I've launched a company in Istanbul. I went to a conference in America and I've, I got back at the weekend from 10 days in uh, Australia. So, you know, I'm very fortunate I get to travel and, and do things like that. Um, so that's from a very personal perspective. But pro the thing that's most precious to me, those of you that are sort of close to me and know, is a hug for my two daughters. I've got an eight-year-old and a five-year-old daughter. And, and that is just like... Now, that's the juice in mm. life. Mm. Uh, you know, it's. I'm very proud of all these things that I get involved in, and seeing all these other people that we support doing all these amazing things. Mm. But honestly, at the most simplest level, is just, uh, you know, my kids making a wreath for me getting the picture when I was in Edinburgh yesterday. You know, just seeing these little creative souls and what they're doing. Mm. So those special moments with them, I think, is, is without doubt that's the the real juice for me. Yeah. And there's all these other things, but sort of on a very deeply personal level. And of course, then my dildo. <laughs> <laughs> so bring it back to the dildo. <laughs> and how about inspiration? Here's a source of inspiration well, for Dave's you. Dave's here. 
<laughs> it's beautiful. Bills, bills, yeah. and tolls. Yeah. Uh, I'm genuinely. Um, so, some of you might. Have, so, I'm a kid from a council estate, right? So, I'm a kid that's well, come in Kent. So, I'm a kid from sort of very little, had very low aspirations, left school with no qualifications. So, that was a story I ran for a long time. So, I had very low expectations. I had big expectations of what I could do, but sort of had, felt that there was very few people that had high expectations for myself. So. Because of that, when you see the talent that I'm surrounded by, and, and one of the things I think is one of the gifts that I've been given is, is that I just, I'm very fortunate that I attract and I work with and I collect these fucking awesome people who mm. just do awesome shit. Mm. And it just, hearing their stories and seeing what they achieve, like what Natalia has done, and, and even resist the usual coming here and seeing you take that brave step, and I know you were feeling nervous and everything else, but I love that because I know I know that if you truly want to be a creative or an entrepreneur, you're going to fall over, you're going to fail. I fail every week. You know, I screw up on stuff every week. We were laughing about the fact that last year I set up something called Leadership Excellence. And, uh, you know, I ran it for six, six sessions, wrote a bunch of thought leadership papers, got absolutely bored by it, <laughs> had an accident, and now I've just left it and it sits out there and I've got this database of 10,000 names. And there's this website called Leadership Excellence, and people are like, oh, Dan, what are you doing with Leadership Excellence? I'm going, oh. <laughs> I don't know, I'm doing this stuff at the moment and one day I might do something else with it. But, but it was like, you know, you could look at it and go, oh, you failed. Mm. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, it's like, I just love playing with things and starting things. Uh, and I love seeing other people play to their potential and to reach, you know, their full potential and to really believe in themselves. Um, and so what I love to do is, like Mo Foundation, which is one of the organisations I've set up, is mm -hmm. you know we've created an environment where wonderful people come together, and we've got these amazing trainers. And I'm not, well, I don't do any of the training, so I create the space for other people to show off, mm -hmm. and then we support lots of other people to kind of grow and develop. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's way out of my control. I've got no control over it anymore, and I don't need to control yeah. it. And it's just got its own purpose. It's got its own energy. And it, you know, I just get these emails sometimes that go, oh, Darren, we're doing this. And I'm like, oh, great, cool. <laughs> Yeah. A lovely position to be in. Yeah, no, yeah. it's it, yeah, no, and it's. Uh, I've learnt um, that humility is 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 a really wonderful place to be because I think when I was younger, I was I was quite fortunate. I had quite a good level of confidence, even though that was beaten out of me somewhat. <laughs> but but the danger with confidence is if it's overplayed, and then there's also a lot of fear. I'm only talking quite a lot about fear. I had a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. So as a kid, I had a lot of voices in my head that were not particularly supportive. Yeah. And coaching and the profession of coaching have, has helped me to sort of quieten down those voices and, and amplify the more positive. Yeah. But the danger of having a level of confidence and then massive fear is that you overcompensate. Mm -hmm. And that can look like you're arrogant. And so, you know, it's been learning over the last 15 years or so that overconfidence can seem like arrogance and actually the place that you want to be in is a place of humility where you go, Jesus, I feel fortunate mm -hmm. and, and a gratitude. Uh, so, you know, I think having gratitude for the small things in life is, is really important. And, and part of the reason why I love travel is because I go to India or I go to Tanzania. Next year we're off to, we're doing some work with Ugandan and Kenyan prisons and we're training the prison guards mm -hmm. to become coaches. So I'm going to go over there and see that. And, and when you go to places like that and you get to see real stark poverty uh, and deprivation, it just blows your freaking mind. Mm. Because then what you want to do is, you want when I meet people here and in other places where we're wealthy and they're bitching about their lives, all I want to do is pick them up and go, come and see this. Because if you see this, then you'll start to appreciate how fortunate you are. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I love being able to do, is kind of translate those stories. So we were laughing earlier about, some of you, you'll hear later, some of them are about um, stories. So my job title in Mo Foundation was Chief Exec, um, Founder and Chief Exec. And some of our young people, including Natalia, went, that's not your job title. Your mm. job title is Chief Storyteller and Firestarter. <laughs> so that's my job title and I love yeah. it. So I, my job is to go out and tell stories that inspire and it's to start things because that's what I'm pretty good at. And then I get out of the way because I'm useless at execution. So when you were, um, you said that you had low expectations mm. of yourself in a number of ways. So when you were a, a young boy, what was it that you wanted to do? Yeah, I wanted to be a footballer. I wanted mm -hmm. to be a play for Manchester United. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I, I loved football. I was addicted to football. I was like half the size I am now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of course. No, no. Mm -hmm. I, I was addicted to football. I played football all the time. Uh, I was pretty good at football, but I wasn't good enough. 
So I just I was desperate, but but equally also I didn't know it was called entrepreneurship, and I get it, I get it mixed up. I can't mm -hmm. remember if I was 11 or 13, but I was about in between those two ages, and I was playing football out the front of my house, and uh, I used to get I used to play so much that I would get the shakes. So I got the wow. shakes because I was playing so much, and my blood sugar level would drop too low, too low. I didn't know any of this. Didn't know that's what was <laughs> going on. Um, and and then I just remember going. And I, I genuinely remember this happening, but I don't remember how I know all these stats. But I was like, God, there's 300 million people in, in Europe. If I could sell them all one product and make a penny off it, I'd make a huge amount of money. And then I didn't think about driving Ferrari. It was genuinely I would make a difference to these kids like me on this estate. Um, you know, cause so how old were you, you when it. you had this moment? Well, I, that's what I'm saying. It's like sometimes I say on videos I've said 11, and then other times I'm like, am I 13? I think I was 11, but I, I'm not sure where, but I was about that age. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, 11, 13, it's much of a muchness, and as much as you, you know, you're a young boy with that sort of sight, in foresight of, of life and what you want to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I didn't know how but, to but do But wanting it. to make a difference, yeah, though. But it was that's difficult. a really profound thing, a thought process to have at that age, at such a young age. Yeah, no, I, I, I genuinely, and it's not a story. Having the shakes and, and that came to you, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, no. Okay, now once again, we've kind of come to our five minutes. So um, at this point, I just want to open it to the floor. Do you have questions that you would like to ask at this point? Yeah, go for it. Yes, so what are good foundations for... Um, great question. Uh, so it's, I think it's similar to a human being. Uh, uh, love, first off, for something. Uh, clear sense of purpose, um, for me, is really important. You've got to be clear on your purpose. The reason for that is it's going to get tough. It's not going to be easy. Uh, and when it gets tough, you need something that's going to draw you through and push you forwards. Um, it needs to have a clear vision. It needs to have people that really believe in it. It needs that, that follower. Um, followership is more important than the leader. Uh, and actually then you've got to have humility to get out of the way and let it go on its own. Uh, so I think those are some of the core mechanisms. You've got to have finance, so I talk a lot very practically when we run the Dream Factory around you've got to have a cash cow. Because uh, what frustrates me is when I meet social entrepreneurs that have got an absolute passion and dream, but they've got no commercial business now. And, I, and my first question is, right, so how are you going to sustain your life? Because it's, it, I've seen too many people, and I've been there myself I've, several times, I've failed, and you know, had absolutely no money left and a mortgage to pay, and it's just not a healthy place mm. to be. So through my own experience and seeing others, you know, you've got to make sure that you've got that sort of cash cow aspect to it as well. But there's, there's a whole load of stuff uh, that you need. Um, That's great advice. Did, hello. Go for it, Simon. <laughs> I'm not you. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I, I've been privileged enough to see you in a number of embarrassing situations over, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, but I want to know what's kind of one of been your biggest embarrassments or most embarrassing situation in that time over the last couple of years. Lovely, Lovely question, Simon. <laughs> Budget. No, I'm trying to think. Like in the last few years, the most embarrassing circle. I can't think of any moments when my trousers have dropped and my ass has hanged out on my dildo. But um, <laughs> give it a rest, Darren. To get it in one last time. <laughs> oh, drop it. We heard it. It's moved up. We don't, I don't want more. Oh my god, I'm trying to think. Embarrassing, embarrassing, embarrassing. I'll tell you an embarrassing moment yesterday. So, I, <laughs> just, that's good. Um, so, I'm at Edinburgh University. I'm talking to a whole bunch of MBAs. Um, and I'm talking about emotional intelligence and 21st century leadership. And I'm about three and a half hours in, and they're starting to dip, and I'm starting to dip. Uh, so I, start, I decide to raise the bar and start talking about the fact that, um, as well as emotional intelligence, that's really important, there's also, you know, you've got to have a level of IQ, uh, you've got to have spiritual intelligence, uh, and, but the other thing that you need to have is physical intelligence. Uh, and, so, and so what I turned around and said was, um, I can't even remember exactly, but I, was, I, I went through those three and I got to physical intelligence and I said, well, one of the things I see about high-performing people is they've always got a physical outlet. And you know when you just go, oh, shh. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. It's like a physical relief, I think I said. And everyone in the room, 35 MBAs, just like instantly went to a place that I wasn't going. And I was like, you know, oh my God. I, mean, I didn't mean that. And then I was like, I must write this one down because that's a good game. Because I'm not that funny usually at all. Um, so that was, pretty, that was pretty embarrassing, actually. That was just yesterday. Um, but I, I can't think of anything else other than the air guitar. But again, we've used that on Facebook, so that's a bit old hat now. <laughs> What's the most extravagant thing you've ever 
Oh my god. I'm not very good at extravagance. Uh, I suppose just just bought a lovely home. Um, I really don't. I think because of my uh, very sort of humble from a uh, from a financial perspective, we didn't have any of that stuff. We didn't have any of the trappings that you know the people I work with in Deloitte. They, they came a lot of them came from very different backgrounds. I did, we didn't have any of that. So because of that, I think sometimes young kids that haven't had any of that strive and desire it. I never did. I didn't learn to value it. I learned, I value relationship over material goods. So I have got a nice home. I've got a pretty standard Audi. I don't have anything like that. I bought several homes, some of which haven't been smart moves. They're probably about the most opulent things I do. But then, you know, for instance, we went to Australia. When I was in Australia before, 20 years ago, I had absolutely no money. So I literally, like, was you know just about scraping and not sleeping on the streets I mean it really was earthy uh, this mm -hmm. time we stayed in the nicest hotels we had nice cars we went helicopter rides we did all this stuff so that was pretty opulent in the last 10 days but again it wasn't extravagant overly extravagant I don't really get the extravagant things I don't it just doesn't float my boat lovely Darren thank you so much Ooh. and <laughs> give it up for Darren everybody you Father, and I've got to go. <laughs> 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 <laughs>